Hello and welcome to the Roundtable Podcast. I am Shogun. Joining me today is my good friend Zhu, the ancient dragon, and we will be discussing futurism, which is one of my major interests. I would define futurism as the extrapolation of social and technological trends into the future in order to predict and analyze what that future will look like and what the implication of those changes would be for humanity. In particular, we're going to talk about things like transhumanism, the singularity, and geoengineering. But before we get into those subjects, please do follow us and subscribe to both YouTube and BitChute, where you can find over 200 of our RT Roundtable podcast episodes. And most of all, make sure you join the Roundtable Discord server, where this podcast is recorded every day at 8 p.m. Central. So that being said, welcome, Zoo, my friend. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good today. How about you? I'm fantastic. I'm enjoying a beer, had a few steaks, uh, watching the election unfold. We will definitely do a aftermath podcast to analyze the results of the election. But today we're going to get into futurism, which, as I said, is thinking about what lies in store for humanity and what these technological and social changes uh, will mean for our species. And I think you already understand how profound these changes really are. So let me uh, just ask you, Zhu, uh, you're the one who proposed this subject. Uh, just get the ball rolling. Where do you see this going? What are some of the areas uh, you're interested in when it comes to futurism? So, yeah, to start off and everything, um, you know, a lot of the big tech companies and uh, co-founder Ray Kurzweil and everything has been pushing the idea of us converging to a technological singularity, which, uh, you know, in layman's terms, means that eventually, as right now, we're in a specialization phase of uh, technology and information, but eventually, um, due to rapid acceleration of this process that's happening, and we're seeing, you know, we've been seeing it in the past couple decades, if you extrapolate that to a convergence event, um, it, it's what they call the singularity, where we hit the eureka, <clears throat> and it entails all sorts of things, uh, such as like a new human, a neo-human. This is kind of the transhumanist, um, some people call it the transhumanist agenda. Some people call it uh, the next step in the human evolution. Um, a, a lot of the things people predict are uh, artificial superintelligence uh, being created, which passed the Turing tests. Um, we currently don't have that capability. Um, I watched a really interesting documentary recently called AlphaGo. And if you know anything about the game of Go, it's something that is very abstract and um, with so many possibilities you couldn't be able to just use uh, regular artificial intelligence to be able to uh, be a very high-end nine-down Go player, which is the highest rank. But if, um, in this documentary, they show how using machine learning and having a machine with the programming that teaches itself over an uh, iterative process, um, how it ended up being the world's best Go player. And so this is a huge litmus test, so to speak, because... Um, like we've done this previously with the chess, but the difference here is instead of feeding the program chess strategies and uh, moves and everything, the machine itself had to learn how to play Go and then how to play Go better than any human on the planet. And this has huge ramifications for us reaching a uh, Turing level um, artificial super intelligence. Right. So I think you've introduced some of the key points. Uh, so again, what we're thinking of is right now it's 2020. We can see what exists in the world right now in terms of technology and the social um, and medical and other you know, fields. If we were to project this 10, 20, 30, 50 years in the future, there's a number of things that are going to transform what it means to be a human being. And you've already identified, right? Artificial intelligence, absolutely massive transhumanism, right? Changing what it means to be human, cybernetic implants, right? Brain implants, artificial limbs, all the different ways we can change what it is to be human so that we become something more than or different than human. Uh, geoengineering, you know, major interests of mine. This is terraforming, right? Terraforming is something that is thought of in terms of changing planets like Mars to be habitable for Earth. But actually, you can terraform Earth, right? There's things you can do to radically change the, the nature of life on Earth, the, the atmosphere of Earth, right? So artificial intelligence, transhumanism, geoengineering, 
virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, robotics, you know, artificial, uh, uh, cybernetics. So there's so many angles we can go to with this, and we are going to open it up to the audience because everybody can uh, brainstorm on this together. But we're going to continue the dialectic a little bit longer. So, you know, the Turing test you mentioned is when an artificial intelligence passes the ability to trick a human into thinking it is a human, right? The point at which you can no longer tell. If you're having, a, this is actually something come up to me personally. I was on Tinder and I was talking to this really attractive Asian girl, but I couldn't tell if she was a real person or if she was a robot or not because her answers were kind of artificial seeming. And I couldn't tell if it was just because she had uh, English as her second language or if she was actually not a person at all, right? And this is actually going to become a real problem in the future. You're going to have to figure out if you're talking to a person or not, right? So I'm trying to think of where we should start to dig into this, Zoo. But I mean, let's start with transhumanism, okay? So transhumanism, again, art, art, altering the human organism, the brain, the body, so that it becomes something more than or different than humans. Like, what is your take on this? What are some aspects of this you're interested in? And generally, what do you think about it? So, yeah, one of the biggest trends uh, that futurists have been talking about, uh, once again, referencing R Ray Kurzweil and other people projecting into 2040, 2050, is being able to upload your consciousness um, onto a, an artificial neural network basically an artificial brain so that we basically uh become post-mortal beings where we're not capable we don't die we're not uh contingent on our biological form anymore um as the only option uh this has really huge implications because this could be the so-called um elixir of life as the philosophers have uh, tried looking for for ages where we've We've obtained a form of immortality, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> another huge thing is uh, trends in um, our understandings of genomes, personal genomes and genetic engineering and our instrumentation in those fields. Um, if you extrapolate this further on and we start developing actual tools and viruses and stuff like that, or just methods in general to uh, manipulate ge um, genetics, as you've probably seen in countless sci-fi movies, there will eventually be... A, uh, you know, designer babies and designer humans. Um, then you've also touched on the cybernetics part, um, which is really important. So, for example, uh, say for you have like contacts lens that have all your augmented reality software um, hooked into it so that you can see the world um, without any sort of fancy glasses or anything uh, with the assistance of augmented reality. You, you'd be just looking with your eyes like you do now, and you can see the time by looking at the up um, right of your eye and uh, using – there's other technologies that they're inventing that are just mind-blowing, like thought-to-text um, uh, programming where you just think it and you can convert your thought into a text or a writing format. And essentially, transhumanism is uh, kind of where all this futuristic ideas and trends in current technology is going to – uh, converge where um, you know like tattoo parlors and everything you'll have cybernetic shops that you can visit and you can you know get these cybernetic um, augmentation to your body you can upgrade you know your, your IQ or your processing speed um, you could all sorts of stuff it looks like we might be able to do within the next 20 30 40 years absolutely correct so if I were to lay it out in a timeline, right, probably the first thing that will happen is transhumanism. Actually, transhumanism has already happened. Uh, a few examples, a uh, person who loses an arm, there's a Navy SEAL, he lost like an arm and a leg in a shark attack, and he was given a prosthetic artificial arm and a leg, and he can actually pick up a Coke can. They can actually feel things now, right? Like the arm can actually feel sensation. You know, he has a leg that actually functions. So that's amazing, right? He's got, he's, an, he's a cyborg, right? But then like I'm bipolar, everybody knows I'm bipolar. Well, they actually have a brain implant that they can put in your brain that it detects when you're having a manic episode and it literally balances the electrical activity in your brain and neutralizes it, right? So it's a brain implant that solves this problem, right? There's people who have eyes, they've lost an eye 
and they can actually see, you know, a, a, an approximation of vision through an artificial eye. Right. So all of these things go in the direction of transhumanism. You could also talk about like nootropic drugs that increase your intelligence. Right. So if you're already a genius, but your parents are giving you some nootropic cocktail of drugs that actually makes you even more intelligent than you could be otherwise, then your intelligence is at an even higher level. And then you can talk about Elon Musk and the uh, uh, Neuralink, right? So the Neuralink is a brain interface where you could essentially plug your brain into a computer and directly interface with the computer, right? And then you have art of, uh, augmented reality. So augmented reality would be like a Navy SEAL is going to war and he sees like displays over his eyes of text that says like target wounded, critical target like target out of range, friendly target, do not fire, right? And it's literally putting tactical overlays over your vision. That's called augmented reality, right? A, a stupid form of augmented reality, or not stupid, but just commercial, would be in the future, a kid will be able to put on glasses or even eye implants, and he'll see the Pokemon in his environment, right? So while he's walking to school, he sees Pikachu pop out from behind a tree, and he can catch the Pikachu. That would be augmented reality. Right. And then, of course, virtual reality. I've experienced that. Right. That's actually mind blowing. You know, you a fully immersive 3D virtual reality situation where it, it totally fools your brain into thinking it's real, but it's it's virtual. So there's all of that. Right. That's what we can do to humans to change them with technology to reach a new level that's out of the reach of what an organic human can reach. So that call that transhumanism. Now, the second effect is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, and I'll try not to go too long, is, you know, already exists, right? It already exists. And artificial intelligence is used for things like playing chess, playing uh, Jeopardy, playing Go. And so in these limited arrangements, artificial intelligence can already outperform humans. But what we don't have yet is what's called artificial general intelligence. So the human being is generally intelligent, right? A human being cannot only play chess or only play Go or only play Jeopardy. We can literally do anything. So if you take an intelligent person, you can give them any different task and they can actually do that task over time because their intelligence can be applied to anything. This is absolutely amazing, right? We take it for granted, but that's what we are. We are incredible creatures. Now, we do not yet have a robot that can do that. But in the future, we will have AGI, artificial general intelligence. Now, the singularity is when artificial... So the Turing test is when artificial general intelligence is uh, indistinguishable from a human. So when you're talking to the AI, you can't tell whether it's a human or not because it's able to answer. You say, how was your day? Oh, my day was great. How was yours? What's your favorite food? I love chocolate ice cream, but sometimes I like vanilla, right? If the, if the robot answers well enough, the, the AI answers well enough, you won't be able to tell if it's an AI or not. That's, what call, that's what's called passing the Turing test, when it can fool you into thinking it's a human. But an even further uh, milestone is called the singularity. The singularity is when artificial intelligence surpasses human intelligence, and from that point on, we'll never catch up again, right? That's when we become, so to speak, obsolete just like monkeys, right? Monkeys don't determine policy. Monkeys don't make technology. They are intelligent, but they're not as intelligent as humans, so they really don't have any say in what happens. Well, once artificial intelligence surpasses humans, we become like the monkeys, right? They leave us in the dust. So that's a big deal. That's the singularity. And that's one of the most significant, you know, changes that will happen in our, in our time, right? So I don't know if you have any take on that before I monologue further, Zoo. Yeah, so uh, there's kind of three classifications of AI in this uh, futuristic sense. Uh, Shogun's already outlined two of them. There's a regular AI that we have, and then there's AGI, which is uh, you know artificial intelligence that passes the Turing test. And then what you have is uh, futurists are currently talking about a concept known as artificial superintelligence, which is basically post-singularity or singularity-level um, AI that uh, is exponentially... Uh, more intelligent than all of humanity like is you could put the asi to um it would wouldn't just pass a turing test it would be hyper turing uh efficient and it would be able to out complete uh humans in just about any task 
Um, and an interesting thing they're also been talking about more recently in the past like year or so uh, is the emergence of ASI and merging our consciousness with ASI so that it becomes basically symbiotic um, as a potential way of ensuring that humans don't become obsolete and there's no robotic takeover of mankind. Right. And that is sort of, in my opinion, the determining uh, factor of our future is what happens with the singularity, what happens with ASI. Uh, does it exterminate us? Does it enslave us? Does it serve us? Right. Because if it serves us, it could actually create utopia. It could create a paradise, right? It, the perfect allocation of resources, solve all our problems, uh, and then we'll have a paradise, heaven on earth, right? If we create a singularity intelligence that actually has human best interests in mind, it'll solve our environmental problems, it'll solve our e economic problems, our ecological problems. But on the flip side, if we fuck it up, well, the Matrix is one example, right, where we're kind of enslaved as batteries to f feed the thing. It could just render us down for meat or just wipe us out like the Terminator. So this is, I think, one of, in my opinion, there's three, at least three uh, existential threats that are faced by humanity in the near future. Number one is ecological collapse, right? If we terminate our ecosystem to the point that it can't sustain our life anymore, then we all go extinct. That's the most likely and the most serious threat. Number two is the artificial intelligence. If the artificial intelligence turns against us like Terminator, well, then it'll wipe us out, you know? And number three is human social conflict, you know, World War III, nuclear war between Russia and China and America. That'll wipe us out too. So if we're talking about futurism, we have to realize that all three of those are near human extinction possibilities. And if we want to survive to achieve what we ultimately want, which is a space age future, right, a Star Trek future, then we have to survive those three existential threats. We can't wipe out our ecosystem. We cannot create an artificial intelligence that will destroy us. And we can't go to war with each other with nuclear or more powerful weapons and that will wipe us out. So is there more that you want to say on these topics, uh, Zoo, any of these three? Yeah, so you covered uh, really well the dystopia aspects of this. And uh, since I'm more on the optimistic side, I just want to uh, quickly cover uh, utopia possibilities of, you know, space conquering neo-humanity, uh, essentially where humans have evolved to the next step because of emergence uh, of consciousness and, um, you know, not just being biological, but silicon based, um, being able to switch freely between the two because it's just one huge neural network connected to each other. Um, you know, merging our consciousness with artificial super intelligence to basically have control over that and be able to use all these machine learning capabilities to pick up skills and information far more than a normal human could ever achieve in a lifetime within hours <clears throat> because of the processing speed and basically being able to rewrite our um, biological and neural networks as we process in information and have a better understanding of it. So what essentially this would look like is, you know, a human that is, you know, a thousand plus IQ who's able to pick up skills through advanced machine learning that they can understand, you know, it seeps into their subconscious and then you know, like the Matrix where um, Neo is uploading skills and techniques to him while he's inside of the Matrix. That's right. And uh, let me know if I'm going to make time, please. But, yeah, we can't underestimate the utopian and positive possibilities of this, right? I mean, absolutely. With a neural and a brain implant you could download all the world's knowledge in a few minutes or a few seconds you could be immortal you could stop your telomeres right from shortening every time the cells reproduce and you could live for hundreds of years or thousands of years you could replace failing organs with artificial organs you know you could have better than 2020 vision you could have superhuman strength you could have a paired AI, right? So each human could have a paired AI that inhabits them, that helps them with everything they do. So it just in any time, you could ask a question, oh, Zoo, you know, you could have an AI called Zoo2. And you could say, Zoo2, what's the fastest way to work? Zoo2, 
what should I do about this situation? Zutu, what's the answer to this question? And it would just automatically give you an answer, right? You'd never have to be in doubt about anything. Now, if we take it even further, not only could you be super strong, super fast, super smart, live longer, super healthy, you would never die, right? And you could actually upload your consciousness into an artificial reality, right? So if you were able to create, using a quantum supercomputer, a simulated reality that was just as real as the real world, right? It could be based on this world, right? An actual one-to-one -one map of this world, or it could be a fantasy world like World of Warcraft, right? Or something like that. But the point is you could actually upload your consciousness in theory into an artificial reality, either now or when you die, right? So say you're getting older and you're about to die. They say, do you want to die? Or do you want to upload your consciousness into a reality of your choosing? And you could say, yeah, I want to upload it into Second Life, which is like based on this reality, or into World of Warcraft, or into Mass Effect, which is a science fiction reality. And then you could literally become an avatar in that world and live forever in one or a series of artificial realities. And it sounds like totally far-fetched, but it's not that far-fetched, right? With quantum computing, you can actually create uh, realities similar in vividness to the actual physical world, which again is the concept of the matrix. And by the way, we're not sure we don't live in one of these realities right now. So you could have a superhuman existence until you reach the end of your mortality and then upload your mind into a mainframe and then you'd be eternal forever living in that, you know, quantum supercomputer holographic domain. So that's where we kind of reach the limits of uh, the limits of transhumanism. But again, we should also mention the Star Trek future, which is that we will eventually pass uh, the limitations on interstellar travel. And so we could create not only a utopia on Earth, but a utopia on infinite Earths, right, in theory, colonize Mars, colonize Venus, colonize the moons of Saturn. Uh, and all these other places in our solar system and beyond. And to be honest, it's not plausible or impossible that we could create a interstellar or even intergalactic empire, right? Now, whether this is likely to happen or not is a question, but whether or not it's possible, it is absolutely possible. So... I, I forgot the formatting. Am I able to, able to chime in? Or you yeah, about? you know, we've been going for a good amount of time. So why don't we just open it up now to audience? Anyone wants to speak? Now's, now's your chance. Well, so I have a couple technologies that were not discussed quite yet. So, so there's companies out there, there's people out there that have been trying to figure out how to psychologically operate on humans. And that's kind of my forte when it comes to the research I've done. The U.S. Air Force was putting a lot of money into projected kinetic holograms, which would m mimic a reality for somebody that wasn't able to understand it was a hologram, like in a dis at the distance, for example. Um, there is a technology called synthetic telepathy, which is the microwave auditory effect. Now, if you attach this thing, this, this microwave auditory effect to a robot that's going to then be able to communicate to people at any place at any time from a tower that they have set up, for example. This is gonna be the effective future that we're seeing. They're gonna build all these cities with towers with long range acoustic devices on it and be able to beam orders to people because they're already testing this for the Pentagon and for, for military right now. They're testing it for psychological operations. They're testing it for uh, command in the field, all kinds of stuff. So they're effectively gonna be like taking, order, taking orders from a machine, which is fine. You know, like that's, they sign up for that and all that. Um, and then these projected holograms are going to be able to further psychologically operate on the human. So if you, for example, wanted the, one of the ones that you talk about fake alien invasion, right? You could literally make holograms of hundreds of flying UFOs that aren't really there, but they look like they are to people on the ground. And there's lots of, uh, stuff out there discussing some of their uses of this. So when we start turning over to artificial intelligence, that's going to expand our consciousness. It's also going to try and control us because it already has a built in modality of controlling us through things like what I just explained. 
and it's a lot easier to do synthetic telepathy than anybody wants to admit. The, there's machines right now you can buy for $70,000 and you could put them in a truck and go right outside somebody's house and literally while they're sleeping, just aim it at their head and say, vote for Trump, vote for Trump, vote for Hillary, vote for Hillary, et cetera. So, uh, and eventually this will all be wireless connected up and, and set up around major cities. The human body resonates at like 10 to 20 Hertz too. So frequencies that can be modulated with an artificial intelligence they can find out what frequency to knock you asleep, wake you up, uh, give you a panic attack by exciting what's called your vagus nerve, which is attached to your heart, stomach, and brain. And if you excite that with a certain frequency at a targeted energy, it will give you a panic attack and you'll think you're like dying. Um, so all these things coupled into what like robots will get, like the robot's not gonna use bullets on you type stuff. It's gonna use what I'm talking about right now. Um, I posted some pictures of stuff from some research on it, but it's something to consider when doing this, when being so happy go lucky about AI, because there's going to be a lot of malevolent, warlike weapons created as a result. There will be Terminator level things going on that have EMF weapons on them that can do these things. It's it's going to be weird. I'm 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 more of a I'm a little pessimistic when it comes to it, just because I've I've seen and understand what these high tech guys are really 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 thinking and working on. And what they what their goals are and their ideology of how they, they view world the world and human rights, people like Kurzweil and all those guys talking about AI. We really need to teach these AIs that we're creating to not do this shit because it, once once it gets to that point, like we're literally going to be puppets being vibrated all day. Otherwise, but anyway, that's all I did. Very good uh, points. Very good contribution. Um, so again, I laid out transhumanism, the most interesting points to me being, uh, or sorry, futurism, being transhumanism, being uh, geoengineering, and the singularity. So unless there's more you guys want to say about uh, these topics, transhumanism and AI, I'm wondering if you guys want to get into uh, geoengineering a little bit. And of course, geoengineering is changing the atmosphere, the planet itself, in an environmental level. Um, and I think this is really important because I think it will happen. Uh, I think it has to happen. And I don't think we've even begun to anticipate or elaborate what the consequences and significance of this will be, right? So, um, yeah, but I just want to ask, is there anything else you guys want to say about transhumanism or AI or the singularity before we talk about geoengineering? Uh, yeah, just one last thing and everything. Uh, if you extrapolate this far enough in the future, um, even if we can't reach faster than light space travel, um, if we beat biological immortality, we could become uh, basically galactic conquerors and, who build mega structures that harvest uh, the potential of s entire stars to their fullest. So it's kind of like that's like end game of futurism uh, thought right now. I agree. I mean, we should point out, right? Uh, in Dune, the Dune series, uh, they conquer the galaxy, right? They have an intergalactic empire. And we could do that. And the same in Warhammer 40,000 with the God Emperor of Mankind they conquer the galaxy you know forty thousand worlds or whatever it is i think it's millions of worlds something like that totally possible right totally absolutely possible not necessarily likely but that's what we're shooting for right we're shooting for a star trek utopia it's also called a post-scarcity civilization right every no need for money no need for resources you wake up in the morning you go to your you know if you watched uh, hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy you put your little you know cup in the matter phaser or whatever and you say espresso and it just fills your cup with espresso or you say you know hot croissant and it just makes a hot croissant you know no resources no money nothing needed everything infinite you know teleportation this is possible we could achieve this this is the goal that we're shooting for but on the other hand we could reach extinction you know ecological collapse global nuclear war uh, robotic enslavement so it's a race, right? Futurism is a race between apocalypse and paradise, you know, heaven and hell. They're both within reach. Uh, 
I, it looks more likely that we're going to have apocalypse, but we could attain if we survive. Like I say, if we survive a few hundred years, even a hundred years, then we're looking at a Star Trek future. But there's a better than 50% chance that in a hundred years we're going to have extinction. And that's, I think, a good tie into um, geoengineering because we are right now facing a global ecological crisis which will render us extinct. And obviously, if we go extinct, we're never going to achieve our greater human future. And geoengineering comes in because, as far as I can tell, this is our last chance. It's our only chance to save ourselves from extinction. Now, geoengineering is technology. Go ahead. No, that's all right. I'm, I can wait. No, what, what were you going to say? Feel free. Yeah, I was going to say, what do you guys think of uh, space colonies? Well, I think space colonies are a necessary step, right? So basically, step one is we need to stabilize our planet, right? Because if we don't stabilize our planet, our planet is the base by which we could establish space colonies, right? Because space colonies require external resources. They require miss like rockets from Earth to come to Mars and drop off supplies, right? So step one is we need to stabilize Earth's atmosphere and Earth's ecosystem. If we're able to do that, step two is establish space colonies, right? First on the moon, then on Mars, then on Venus, then on the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, and then potentially out into space and then beyond, right? I can't really think beyond. But the so, the go ahead. <clears throat> so to tie th this question into geoengineering, I think a perfect example is uh, terraforming is a form of geoengineering and uh, the current crisis. Uh, you dropped out. Was that my end? Or? No. Uh, so I'll let Shogun uh, elaborate more on the methane crisis under geoengineering. But if we can get geoengineering done right on Earth, we can extrapolate that to terraforming other planets, which is a key ingredient to uh, having space colonies. Right. So, I mean, I will just say I wrote my graduate thesis, my master's thesis on the topic of the global ecological crisis is not just about methane. Methane is the scariest issue out of many scary issues. But the reality is, um, so ecos means house, right? Ecosphere means like our home, right? The ecosphere is our home. Now, your home is where you live. If your home is destroyed or compromised, you cannot survive, right? If your house is on fire or filling up with gas, you cannot survive. So the only way humanity can survive is if we stabilize our ecosphere. Throughout history of the planet Earth, there has been a series of global mass extinction events. This is what we could call like apocalypses or Armageddon's end, end of the worlds, right? So the world has actually ended about six times, maybe more, in the geological history of the Earth. Uh, there was the Precambrian oxygen holocaust. There was the meteor impact that wiped out the dinosaurs. There was the eruption of Krakatoa, which was a super volcano. So multiple ways that Earth's life has basically ended. And to be a mass extinction, we call it like more than 95% of life on Earth dies. And that includes plants, insects, animals, right? So we are currently in the seventh, at least the seventh global mass extinction is happening right now. People don't know this, but it's already started. This isn't like in the future. This is already happening, right? Now, this is called the Anthropocene. Anthro means human, Pocene, whatever means age, the age of humanity. But we have, you know, we've destroyed all the forests. We've uh, fished out the oceans. We've polluted everything, contaminated everything. And so life is not able to adapt to the stress that humans are putting on it. So this altogether is the global ecological collapse, right? And it's well underway and over 50% of life is basically already gone and even more of it's going to go. So we have to solve this problem because if we don't stabilize Earth long enough, we won't have time to go anywhere else, right? Now, the big problem to me is, okay, so... The problem we have is caused by overpopulation, too many people, overconsumption, people consuming too much, waste and pollution, people producing waste and, and detritus from what they do, uh, and energy and efficiency, so on and so forth. You know, 
ineffect ineffective forms of energy, right? Um, but the big problem is methane, and I'm going to have to do a whole podcast on this in the future, just on this subject. But yeah, right now, okay, so there are vast reservoirs of methane under the ocean, under the ice, under the permafrost, uh, under the peatlands. Unbelievably huge amounts of methane exist there. That methane has been trapped under the permafrost, which means permanently frozen, for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. But now, because of the push of human global warming, right, carbon or whatever that we emitted, we've warmed the planet enough that the ice has melted and now that methane is coming out. Now that's literally happening now. Like these articles are coming out from like the last few days. Like this is current to the like within this week and within the last couple of years, this methane is getting out. Now the problem is when this methane gets out, this little frost covering dissolves, we start getting the bubbles coming up. That's what's happening now. But when that methane passes a tipping point, it will come up like bloop, bloop, like all at once, like like a fart, like all at once. Now, this is the end of the world, folks. This is this will cause a massive warming event. And unfortunately, we know exactly what will happen because this happened once before in Earth's history. And uh, when it happened last time, it was the worst mass extinction event, worst mass extinction event in human, in not human history, in the history of the planet Earth. And I think it's over 99% of life on Earth died. They called it the great dying. That's what they called it. So in other words, I hate to tell you, if you haven't heard of this before, the world is ending right now. We are in the end of the world. This is the fucking apocalypse right now. And within the very near future, we will all die. There is no way we can survive this. Now, there is one way we can survive this, and it's geoengineering, right? So we need to technologically and scientifically intervene in the Earth's atmosphere in such a way as to cool the planet sufficiently to counteract the massive overheating that will be caused by the release of these methane reservoirs. So if we don't do global geoengineering now, we can literally kiss our ass goodbye. And so when I talk about trans or sorry, futurism, I talk about, do we do geoengineering? We have to. It's our only hope. Yeah, one of the ways uh, scientists are currently looking at counteracting problems like this is uh, using uh, uh, diatomic or uh, monoatomic gold particles and putting them in the atmosphere, basically, to help reflect uh, sunlight and everything. Um, or you act as a filter to cool down the planet. If we cannot solve this problem, then all the futurism talk, all the you know possible dystopia or utopia becomes nothing. It ends up being humanity loses, end game, apocalypse. Uh, you know, there might be a remnant. If we're lucky, if, um, a remnant might survive. But uh, without geoengineering, we will not be global climate change yeah that's right i mean basically we have in front of us this like incredible future right this incredible star trek future star trek star wars dune whatever you want to say right this amazing future but if our little planet that we're stuck on now dies off then obviously we'll never achieve it and unfortunately, now this methane is venting. And that means that we are literally going to have a rapid, uncontrollable heating event starting right now, like today, right, November 3rd, uh, 2020, into the future. And it will literally cook us alive, right? All our crops will die and there'll be forest fires. All the forests will light on fire. The sky will fill with smoke. The atmosphere itself might actually light on fire. Uh, and we'll all burn and melt, right? Which is actually in the Bible. It says the, uh, the heavens will pass away with a roar, the earth will be melted with fire, and all things will be destroyed in heat. And that appears to me to be what's actually going to happen. So then the question becomes, how do we stop this, right? And we actually have answers to this. So I don't know, we might as well get into it. So one of them is called stratospheric aerosol injection. And Zoo talked about this, right? You take monoatomic gold particles. There's many different ways you can do stratospheric aerosol injection. 
But it's interesting because uh, Eric von Daniken, who wrote Chariot of the Gods, like he was like one of these ancient astronauts people. He actually said these aliens came to Earth in ancient times to mine gold. And when they asked him, why did they mine gold? He said, because their atmosphere was overheating. Their planet was overheating and they needed gold to seed their atmosphere to cool down their planet. Well, <laughs> it turns out that's a totally valid thing. And that's ab actually works. Sorry, that actually works. And so he may have been onto something there. But yes, you can seed the atmosphere with gold to do this. You can also do it with coal fly ash and other things. But basically, it's like chemtrails. You know, you fill the atmosphere with particles. Those particles reflect solar radiation back into space. That's what you call albedo. Albedo is the amount of solar radiation the Earth radiates back into space. And albedo comes from, for example, ice, right? So ice cover, when there's ice, it reflects solar radiation back into, into space. Well, as you guys know, the ice has been melting, right? The Arctic ice, the Antarctic ice has been melting. The more the ice melts, the less albedo there is, the more the Earth absorbs heat instead of reflecting it, which, of course, melts more ice. It's, it's, it's a series of chain reactions, right? And in the permafrost, you'll see this melting of the ice. The ice makes a hole. The methane vents out of the hole. The methane heats the atmosphere. More ice melts, more holes open up. And it's a chain reaction. So the problem is right now is just the beginning. But this is like dominoes. Like it's once it gets going, it's going to go faster and faster. So the point is, if you put particles or mirrors, you can actually put mirrors in space, either big or small, and they'll reflect solar radiation back into space and cool the planet now if we did enough stratospheric aerosol injection to reflect enough solar radiation back into space we could cool the planet enough that the permafrost and the ice would melt again which would then trap the methane before it releases but i cannot stress enough we probably have five years to do this like this is not very much time at all uh, but we can do this, right? And we have to do this. And now we don't want to do coal fly ash because if we do coal fly ash, which is the most economical and easy way to do it, uh, yes, it'll work, but we'll all get um, cystic fibrosis and, and lung diseases because we'll be breathing in coal fly ash. So that's not good. Now, the monoatomic gold, that would be like the caviar. That'd be like the pristine. That'd probably make us all fucking immortal and shit. Uh, monoatomic gold is supposed to be very good for you. Uh, the one I prefer, though, is we take all the battleships, all the aircraft carriers, all the naval vessels of the world, China, Russia, and America. You retrofit them so that they suck seawater up the bottom. They put them through an engine in the middle, and they shoot out clouds, right? They just vaporize uh, seawater, and they leave trails of clouds behind them, right? They're shooting up steam, basically. And so what we do is we have these naval vessels go back and forth across the ocean. Instead of waging war, they'd be creating huge clouds of, of cloud cover, just vaporized seawater. And that cloud cover would reflect solar radiation, create albedo, and cool the Earth. And that basically is the name of the game, is cool the Earth, because the methane is going to heat the Earth. And if we don't counteract it, we're, we're going to die of heat, which is not a good way to die. I mean, yeah, not just that, um, massive flooding on the earth, um, not being able to produce crops and agriculture like we used to because of uh, the changes in climate, um, overheating that will mass cause mass extinction of, of animals that we depend on for food. I mean, um, on the flip note, though, if we can figure out proper geoengineering techniques, methods, and technology, we could uh, use this later on for terraforming like i mentioned earlier so either way it becomes a the most beneficial thing that uh scientists and world leaders and engineers should be focusing on because we got one shot uh, one shot at this and if we don't make it then it's it's game over you know it's a huge reset yes that's right. And I'll just mention that there's a few other things we can do. One is called ocean seeding, right? So you can actually seed the ocean with article, uh, particles of iron. And if you seed the ocean with particles of iron, it will cause giant algal blooms, right? So entire parts of the ocean will become algae, like green. And that algae will suck greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. 
which will clean the atmosphere. But of course, that will cause, you know, huge ecological problems in its own right. Um, there's other things we can do, like carbon sequestration and storage. You can make huge um, devices that literally pump the greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere into the ground and store them underground. Uh, and you can even do things like create like gigantic mirrors, like satellites, like huge satellites that reflect solar radiation back into space. But as far as I can tell, the main one is going to be stratospheric aerosol injection. I can post uh, images that show how this is actually done. But the point I want to make is this, right? It's like we will see geoengineering, right? So one of the possibilities of this is the sky would actually become gray and not blue anymore which would be horrible tragedy, right? Horrible tragedy. But what it would mean is the sky is now reflecting solar radiation back into space so that we don't overheat and die. And that would allow us then in our laboratories to develop the artificial intelligence, the transhumanism, the cybernetics, the uh, robotics, and all these different things that can allow us to have virtual reality, augmented reality, upload our consciousness to a mainframe, uh, have cybernetic brains, uh, and eventually make spaceships, go to outer space, colonize other planets, right? So I guess what I want to make clear about this is like, if we want to have the Star Trek future, we have to do ge geoengineering. If we don't do geoengineering, we're, we're looking at global human extinction in one lifetime, right? In our lifetime, like I'm 33. And I don't, I don't see a very good chance that my children will exist, let alone grow up. Like, we are about to go extinct. But if we don't go extinct, we can literally colonize space. Well, so, Shogun, have you done any research into uh, foundations like the WFF, the, the World Wildlife Fund, that's funded by the Rockefellers through the United Nations, or the Rothschilds, rather, not Rockefellers, through the United Nations? They've displaced indigenous tribes across planet Earth quite extensively and there is something that there there's a form of geoengineering they're working towards which is what alex jones talks about which is agenda 20 30 and agenda 21 where this this plan is to basically force people in from the major cities or all into major cities effectively and have super cities and then you know save the rest of the world for for whatever else they want for resources trees and whatnot um but there's also another study done by the united nations about population and they they've they believe that the population will level out based on all kinds of factors at around 12 billion so we will hit a, a, a peak at 12 that would that should carry it through there um, because by that time all the other nations of the world will have all the medications running water whatever birth control etc cetera, etc cetera, going on in their countries and worlds so, I mean there's there there is a lot of thought going into this stuff and Geoengineering itself, you're talking like the, the lungs of the earth in Brazil and how they're they're hacking them down. And so a lot of that stuff, again, is this land is being reappropriated from indigenous people. The indigenous people won't be tearing it down. But these other these other groups are, are doing this. Nestle is doing a lot of fucked up shit around the world. So there's regulations that without any kind of like control through the United Nations or, or a centralized something, uh, they'll, they'll go wild, the corporations will go wild and you can't like, what are you gonna do, send the military at these these corporations that are fucking the land up at that point in like Brazil, for example? What are you gonna invade Brazil? Are we gonna invade Mexico to get rid of the cartels? You know, it's like getting really fucky lately. Yes, I agree. Uh, and there is, a downside to such things. Uh, I don't know whether World Wildlife Fund is overall negative or positive. Um, but, you know, yeah, I do think we need to send the military for certain things, right? So in, in the rainforest, they're like burning the rainforest to create uh, beef agriculture, right? They're burning the rainforest to, you know, do farming for McDonald's burgers, right? If, if necessary, hell yeah, send in the fucking green berets, right? If that, that will be the best possible use of, of the Navy SEALs to protect. I mean, God, I wish there was a world where the military was deployed to defend the environment, you know, of course. But all it comes down to is ecological resources preserve human life. If ecological resources cease to exist, human life ceases to exist. Uh, that's a reality. 
right? It's a hard reality. And my big fear, it's not even a fear, it's kind of a resignation, is that humans, their mentality is not in the right place. Their consciousness is not in the right place. They don't understand that they're in an exist existential threat. They think that the ecosystem is just this infinite reservoir that they can infinitely draw on, and they don't understand that they're already bankrupt, right? They're already out of money. They're trying to go to the bank every month and, and cash a check. And the, the planet Earth is like, you already fucking used it all up, bro. Where is it going to come from? You already fished out 90% of the fish. You already cut down 90% of the trees. You already polluted the atmosphere. You already filled the ocean with plastic. You know, and people are just like, oh, yeah, Earth. Earth provides everything we need. Yeah, it did. It did. But there, is quite a, there is quite a lot of effort right now going into tra planting trees. I think there was a big effort, like a billion in India. A bunch in Africa. There, there's a lot of stuff going on to actually plant these trees. There was one. There was one. There's a story. One guy, and I think in around, I think it was Vietnam. Uh, he planted trees in an entire like couple acre location, and and ten years later, it's now like a fucking rainforest, and it was totally barren. And they have before and after pictures of stuff. So it is possible to do these things, and there is effort to do it and make awareness of it. So while I while I agree, it is. Uh, a very dangerous thing we're dealing with when it comes to, to the earth. It, it, it is something that effort is being put into. I agree. I mean, if we actually focused, right, even for one generation, even for 10 years or a hundred years, right? If we literally were like, holy shit, guys, we need to fix the earth in a, in a very short time, we could plant a billion trees. You know, we could restore millions of miles of coral reefs we could repopulate, you know, millions of species, right? Like, this is not beyond our capabilities, not in the least bit. The problem is, though, that we focus our energies on military, weapons, technology, economy, the stock market, and we just pollute and pollute and waste and waste, right? So it requires a consciousness shift. People need to wake up, shit their pants in fear, and then fucking save their lives, right? Because people have shown that they can do this, right? Like when the Germans or the, the Japanese were our enemies, we figured out the Manhattan Project and we made nuclear bombs. When we wanted to have the moon race with the Soviets, we, we figured out how to put a man on the moon. Like we just need to wake up and realize that that's the kind of problem we're facing. And we need to do it not just as one nation, but as a global initiative, right? One world. Sorry, I agree, but to, to fear porn it and scare the shit out of people and guilt them into it, I trust me, I, I know what you know type stuff, so I'm not saying, but the efforts that people have been making has literally been to scare the shit out of people, guilt the shit out of people, and force them into a mode that, that without any kind of education on it. You know, like, it's, it's kind of rough. A little off topic, but sorry. No, actually... Oh, go ahead. Go, go, ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry, the female voice, because we didn't hear from her yet. Yeah, and I understand what you're saying. And I say, like, people don't like fear porn. They don't like that. But this is an existential situation, right? We, we, we are actually facing human extinction. And you can call that fear porn, but that's the actual truth, right? There's no other way to tell it. So it's like, if a, if a, sci if a doctor tells you you have one month to live without treatment, you can't say, oh, that's fear porn. No, it's just your diagnosis. It's just the actual fact, right? Within one month, the cancer will kill you. So you need to find a cure within one month that will cure you or you will die. And if that's scary and that bothers you, well, too bad, so sad. That's the reality. The reality is we can't live without air. We can't live without water. We can't live in an excessively hot climate, etc. So our best bet is for the whole planet, Japan, China, Germany, Russia, India, etc., to realize as one that we all live or we all die together. Imagine what could happen 
if all 8 billion people on the planet Earth and all the nations of the Earth, India, China, Russia, Israel, etc., work together with the, all their scientists and all their resources to solve this problem, we would survive, we would live, and we could attain the Star Trek future. If we have this denialism, right? Our, our big curse here, our big doom is denialism. It's people saying, no, this isn't true. The scientists are lying. This, this isn't real. That's what will fucking kill us. It's the fact okay. that people are living in a house on fire and they don't realize their house is on fire. At least if we realize our house is on fire, we can figure out how to put it out. And believe me, we can put it out. It's not outside of our technology. It's outside of our social and political will. Okay, so but I think this is the perfect opportunity to switch it to the next uh, topic because it, it does relate to this. So um, okay. a lot of people believe that the global elites are going to use this to try creating a transnational order or a one world order this would be the perfect opportunity for the world leaders to basically be like look we got a global catastrophe we all have to get together and we all have to unite and then transition into a basically worldwide oh, you're hot, you, you, you what you're hot mike let's we're getting feedback bad sorry yeah, so um, like the EU or um, the United Nations, where it's just one world government, um, where so, each country has a, so much of a say. I was trying to get in before, to re this applies to that. There's still three and a half billion people without the internet and, and like running water and uh, you know sewage and all these things. There's, there's still a lot of countries that just won't aren't capable of disseminating information the way that it is needed there these people these are third world countries they still exist apparently people don't realize this there's still large amounts of inequality going on in countries like africa for example if you watch any of the women's rights things that are going on in africa it's it's a it's it's like hell there's there's still a lot of shit going on that they don't these 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 countries aren't prepared and then if you step in like some kind of like big dick american or whatever canadian you know like they're just going to tell you to fuck off because like you know <laughs> like I, that's how i look at it at least i think that these countries are not are not prepared and they're living in and like you know the 60 plus countries that the cia has toppled their dictators and stuff like that and their democracies they're, they're not all up to par to be able to handle a one world situation right now but if you just come at them and confront and say hey motherfuckers the rest of the world is in on this so you got to get in on this and that's kind of like and that's kind of Well, and that's the thing, though. Like these get some of the, like I said, three and a half people don't even have the internet, so they don't even know what artificial intelligence is. They're like, "What God?" You know, like what? You know, I mean, they they know what it is because they were told, but it's um, let's let's get people to trust. Back. Even yeah. what they're doing in America, they're having a very hard time getting people to trust in artificial intelligence right now, right? because I science agree. from yeah. all, call it conspiracy theories, theory or whatever you want to call it, a lot of people don't trust scientists. Because they're aligned with government that has been doing some very malevolent things over the last quite quite a while. So we're gonna give the mic back to Zoo because although I agree with you, there's a major problem with social buy-in and political buy-in, and that is why we probably will all die. Uh, nevertheless, Zoo was taking it in a further direction, and I don't I don't want to derail that. So go ahead, Zoo, with whatever you were saying. So the way the world orders have worked uh, for the past 6,000 years since the dawn of civilization is uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And I could very well see the possibility of a uh, future society m moving towards a one world order or uh, the first ever transnational order similar to the whole Tower of Babel all over again, except worldwide, not just uh, centralized in Babylon, as in the Genesis 11 story. Um, this has kind of been a hot topic amongst conspiracy theorists for a while, um, especially conspiracy theorists who are Christian, because this ties into um, end times biblical prophecy 
um, eschatology sort of thing about how, uh, say, for example, uh, the elites could use this sort of event or an event like it, you know, a near human extinction event to be like, hey, we got to all get together and be part of one huge uh, transnational or global government and then uh, start enacting things like one world currency, one world language, um, and use that opportunity to homogenize uh, homo sapiens as a whole into being one cohesive tribe, essentially. If you haven't watched it yet, I linked a uh, video by the Corbett Report on the Great Reset. So the New World Order got turned into this, the World Economic Forum through Davos and all the guys that link up with that. They've basically repackaged the concept of New World Order and are totally upfront with all of it too. So they're, they're linking it to Agenda 2021 and 2030, uh, mm -hmm. COVID and all this stuff. So this is this, this is the plan in the world for your planet. So if you are uninformed, I would definitely watch this episode at least and maybe even more on the actual Great Reset. Klaus Schwab is the guy's name and he wrote a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset and is running this scenario with these very wealthy investors, Prince Charles, uh, you know, all these guys are doing it. So the, their key phrases are equality and inclusivity and all this other stuff. Except radical Islam, though. Except for so it's, but um, so there are globalists, internationalists that are working and collaborating with all these co corporations. So it's not really conspiracy necessarily. It's they, they literally are getting together and trying to figure something out. But I would check it out. It's worth watching. Yeah, I mean, even with the Great Reset idea and everything, that would be just a method to tie in uh, economies together uh, to a one world economy, essentially, instead of a bunch of competing nationalistic economies. So that still kind of goes into, uh, uh, you know, what I'm talking about. They're having to play on the fly and everything, but overall, it's looking towards the same goal that conspiracy theorists and a lot of other people have been uh, worried about for a long time, which is just a uh, one world government with uh, one huge uh, transnational, not international uh, g economy that functions um, with, you know, a huge centralized bank um, with, you know, say English or Mandarin as the uh, primary language used mm -hmm. and any other languages being seen as, sub, uh, you know, not sufficient enough or just being held by their nationalistic or dialectical groups. Yeah, and it's like, there's lots of biblical stuff, too. They talk about, you know, shattering all the cultures of the world. God shattered, spread all the cultures and all the religions of the world around the world and languages and all this other stuff. It's, uh, it's quite a mess, especially when there's, you have to convert everything, translate everything. Every, every monetary system has about, like, I get why they want to do it in a centralized aspect. The problem is, is the plan that was laid out. Would, would lead to what's called a master and a serf. So you would be a serf to the masters, to the elites. Elite serfdom is what, it, is what the world, the, what the structure would have been. Because that's kind of how it, even a communist world like the USSR went to after with the oligarchy now, that's now a, a elite serf scenario. So that's what they wanted. That's kind of what they still want. And uh, even China, their communism is still communism with capitalism mixed in, kind of kind of thing. It's it's an interesting dichotomy. And there's currently three world like monetary world orders on the planet right now between the the, the shipping routes and everything that's going on. Like our navy, the U.S. Navy protects a lot of the shipping routes right now for a lot of the tankers and shipping and all this stuff. So. It's just, uh, and then if there's another map you can look at that's interesting to find out is like what countries actually acquire uh, components for things from other countries like like uh, China. They rely a certain percentage on other countries for their components, for cars, for, you know, for anything they need. Uh, America is actually at the best position right now for most of their stuff. The only things that we would have to rely on is like, you know, a lot of hard drive stuff is made over in like Taiwan, for example. There was a... Uh, a tsunami that took out a couple plants that was made a lot of components for hard drives and they were, were gone off the shelves for a couple of years or six months or so. Point being is that if one economy shuts down, like in COVID, so COVID has shown us, showed the whole world where, where the weaknesses lie and where the trade routes lie. And so, I don't know, it should be interesting. And China's doing the one belt, one road stuff that's connecting a lot of shit through Africa. 
Yeah. So what you uh, uh, talked about and everything, you know, goes back to the concept of there's, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, this is basically be a neo-Roman uh, master surf relationship on um, that extended into medieval Europe times. It'd be almost like a, a neo technocratic feudalism, so to speak, um, where, you know, people buy up so much of the, uh, you know, private individuals buy up so much of a GDP debt. And, you know, if your GDP debt is uh, owned by these other people that, you basically become their bond servant until you could pay it off. Or if you could pay it off, you know, if you can't, can't, then you're just a bond servant, you know, until the day you die sort of concept. This is something yeah. they've uh, wanted for a while. It's like that Rick and Morty episode with the, where they go inside the, the world and it's like, Oh, this is just slavery, but with extra steps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's a, Neo slavery, you know. Oh, you're a bond servant, not a slave. <laughs> you know, semantics kind of thing. Well, I think it would. Oh, I'm sorry that you. Well, I think it would it would cripple certain economies, though, is what it would do, because it would affect carbon, because all they're all convinced through all the science that if we just shut off all the carbon, everything will go be fine. So they, the Paris Climate Accord was thought of, and the Paris Climate Accord was a way to tax carbon credits, so that the corporation it's effectively a global tax system on corporations that it could limit and regulate what they do, because they'll say you're making this much carbon, we're taxing you this much, and this, we're going to put that into geoengineering money and all this other stuff. So for certain industries like the oil industry and stuff like that, it would cripple it. Now, everybody wants to talk about electric cars, and that's fine, but you need lithium for that. And there's like three places on Earth right now that they can get it from in major factories. One of them's China. Uh, <laughs> one of them's South America. So in order to get these, these technologies going, and whether you want to believe it or not, there's other technologies out there that many governments are hiding that have been in research for a long time. Uh, you can power a car with a glass of water. And they just don't want you to know that because if you did that, it would crash what's called the petrodollar, which is the backing and foundation of almost all the economic systems of the world. So they're scared as shit to let us have these new technologies, which would could potentially crash certain you know, financial interests of their banker buddies. But... The uh, so those new technologies are are suppressed. Like there's literally a group within the U.S. Mil military, the contracting companies called the dark journalist calls it the Expertech guys. They basically go around kidnapping, killing, and ruining anybody that comes out with these new energy technologies because mm -hmm. there's there's many options for these new energy technologies. So they were going to control the energy. They were going to tax it all, and they were going to run the world through the Paris Climate Accord concept of taxation so when alex jones talks about this shit he's not far off um but the root of it is is new energy products and and that is where there, we are being lied to about that um and that would save the planet would have saved it 70 years ago if they didn't cover up some of the stuff that they have and know so i so just want to point out what what nsa said earlier like this will be our downfall it's not that we can't create the technology to solve these problems it's that there won't be the social and political will. There will be people who say, no, climate change is a myth. Uh, no, like, this isn't real. That's denialism. And then there'll be people saying, no, we deserve to have further development. Like, we're, we don't have internet. We don't have technology. We need this. We need that. So all I want to emphasize is the thing that's dooming us is not going to be that we can't solve this problem. It's going to be that we don't believe the problem exists, we deny it, or we refuse to face it, you know? And that, that honestly is why I think we are doomed, because there's always going to be people who want to stick their head in the sand rather than face the problem. We could solve it. We absolutely could. We're not going to be able to cooperate. We're not going to be able to work together. As a, I don't want to say we can't, but it looks unlikely. You know, people say, oh, America developed to such a high degree, we should be available to uh, develop to the same degree. You know, you guys have all this technology, we should have the same, you know, and they just, and that's fine, right? Yeah, they should, but they won't work together. So that that's all I want to emphasize is we can technologically pro solve this problem, but we haven't shown that we can work together as a species. 
so, well, I just uh, want to uh, wait, wait, can I answer her yeah. question and everything? Uh, so, yes, this uh, uh, situation, if it was forced upon us, uh, we would be denied individual rights and it would be more oppression on us. But it would also force the hand for uh, collaboration instead of all this uh, international conflict and everything. What the globalists want is uh, forced collaboration and that people actually work together and everything. So under a transnational world order, um, you know, people, countries couldn't just simply ignore uh, things like the Paris uh, Climate um, Accords and other deals that they've been talking about, um, it would force our hand and they would be able to basically t tax more money from us um, and push geoengineering more accelerated because they would be able to get people to actually collaborate internationally instead of having uh, competing national interests get in the way. Um, and personally, I think this is why they're letting the problem get out of hand. I, I, I think the elites are letting this happen on purpose so that they can capitalize it, you know, just using enough foresight to realize if it gets bad enough, people will be forced to uh, rely upon the elites and the uh, top level institutions. And then that's when they come in and make their major play and connect everything together. Well, that's and, what and I want to do. That's what I wanted to focus. That's what I wanted to emphasize that we could have been off fossil fuels decades ago. They wanted to keep us on fossil fuels because it was linked to our monetary mm -hmm. system. And then it was the Rockefeller Foundation is the foundation for all the research on this stuff, too. When there's there's mil hundreds of millions of dollars put into it and it's all fed through. the And they were biggest backers of the Paris Climate Accord. If you all know what the Rockefellers are, they own Standard Oil, which was this conglomerate oil company in the 19 early 1900s that bought up everything it was a monopoly and they had to break it up and they still kept going with it so they had big interest in, in keeping oil as the thing They're, they suppressed for decades and probably 50 100 to 100 years all kinds of stuff they they for new technologies for new energy they uh they were the push for the vehicle itself which is really funny they committed these crimes and raped the world of their oil and and, and pumped all this carbon into the into the atmosphere but at the same time have, are now shaming us all for what they've done. And they, they, they would lobby you to, against like um, bus transit and trains and things like that in major cities. That's why a lot of major cities don't have this anymore because they, they lobbied it all out so that they would all rely on vehicles and spread it all out. So the entire transit system in America is like fucky right now. Most countries have way better systems than set up. So there's a ton of, there's a ton of reasons why I believe that these elites fucked us all in, with the intention of making as much money off of us as, as, as we could as they could because again they're, they're sitting on we could have had nuclear plants all over the place we could be on next generation nuclear plants thorium all kinds of stuff to get off all kinds of things like that and then again like I said there's tons of, of energy systems that could be running a car right now that they've known about so when if you want blame like you, you can't blame the politicians you can't blame the countries or the you know anything like that yeah you, you've got to blame these people and the, the oil companies that are funding this because their their empire relies on oil and it has and it always will and all their money that they made off oil goes into other companies they invest and buy in uh, they own a lot of the education systems and things like that the Rockefeller Foundation has been pushing all kinds of education uh, agendas so I'm like it's it is the, the that was the world order it was run by that asshole that died recently and a couple of, after like 101 was seven heart transplants but there's still 240 living rockefellers right now and they want to maintain their power and they've got the entire fucking army our intelligence community everybody paid the fuck off yeah something interesting you uh touched upon and everything is uh you know next gen vision um energy production has been stifled because of uh you know behind the scenes um, machinations of machinations politically uh, to prevent us from uh, building nuclear plants and being able to be mostly nuclear producers like countries like uh, France. France gets most of its energy from nuclear and furthermore um, research into fusion has gone to the wayside which would be you know the holy grail of energy production that would completely destroy any need for oil um, personally, I think they're doing that on purpose so that, you know, they can drain up the oil reserves and make use of all the hydrocarbons instead of letting it go to waste. Um, and then then moving on to fission or uh, fusion production, you know, at the last moment.
Yeah, so, you know, I think we've gone on a good journey through transhumanism to artificial intelligence to the singularity to ecological collapse to the uh, geoengineering to the space age and the post-scarcity civilization what we call the star trek future space empire so i think we've covered our ground here right and what i want people to know is if we solve our ecological problem and we avoid war with one another we can attain a future that is beyond our wildest dreams. But if we don't solve that problem, we will bring about a hell, right? And there's a book called The Road. I think it's uh, McCarthy or McCormick or something. I can't remember who wrote the book, The Road. But it's a good description of what will happen if we allow this climate change problem to go to its natural extent. Uh, It is a horrific, horrific situation. So we are in a race between heaven and hell, between paradise and Armageddon, between, you know, uh, the Star Trek post-scarcity future and the absolute end of the world. So we need to focus on this. And my motto will be global geoengineering now. We need it now. It needs to start yesterday. Okay, it needs to start fucking yesterday. And we don't have time to sit around and debate about it. And is it real? And is it not? I'm sorry, it is real. We knew it was real a long time ago. I wrote my thesis about this many years ago, and I, it gave me nightmares for a long time. Well, everything I had nightmares about at the time was hypothetical. Now it's all actual, right? The things I was worried about as possibilities, they've not, now all actually happened. And the problem is people are not going to believe me. They're not going to believe me. Right. Even now, you're not going to believe me. You're going to think somehow this isn't true. And that's why we're probably all going to die. But I have hope that somehow it might work out. So maybe this podcast will reach some people and we'll do this. Right. It's not that hard. Retrofit our fucking naval vessels to make artificial clouds, reflect some solar heat, cool the atmosphere a bit freeze up that permafrost again, slow down or stop the release of that methane. You don't do that, you're going to cook alive and your family's going to die. Okay? So geo, global geoengineering now, people. If you want to live, if you want a future, we got to do it. It doesn't matter what you think, your religion, right? I'm religious, I'm Christian, right? And you can't say, oh, I'm, it's fake, climate change is fake. No. It's not going to save us. It's not going to save your children from cooking alive in your arms. Okay? Wake the fuck up, people. Get real. That's all I have to say about it. By the way, we have a channel on the server called Methane Crisis. Read about it. I will be continuing to document this until the end of the world. You will see it in real time in that channel. Does anybody, perhaps Zoo, have a closing statement? Yeah, so just to kind of tie it back to the beginning and everything, uh, you know, if we're able to figure out geoengineering and how it works and be able to do this successfully, you know, humanity has potentially a bright future of being able to solve just about any problem and uh, have potentially a post-scarcity um, economy where you know there's so much supply and so much means to produce that supply that demand and cost uh, become deflated instead of inflated and so we're talking about being able to buy food for you know a tenth of the price that we currently do and still make more money or generate more wealth from our actual professions um, that's kind of like the optimal end game for the average man is so that their children and their children's children become better, smarter, faster, more educated, and are able to generate more wealth for themselves uh, and also develop technology and production means so that uh, part of their profession, they're doing it more efficiently on a better scale and able to uh, coordinate and socialize in a more pro-social way so that people get along and we don't have as much of a need for legalism or moralism on a societal level because people have basically socially evolved to the point where uh you know people actually respect each other and all sorts of things that's what i'm hoping for but there's so many hurdles and obstacles
cleaning in that kind of bath, that it might never happen. Oh, yeah. On stratospheric aerosol injections, the Central Intelligence Agency is putting $10 billion into it. And that's discussed by uh, John Brennan of the Council on Foreign Relations a couple of years back. So it's kind of interesting. They're actually putting that much money into it. All right. So this is what I want to close on. If we do global geoengineering now and we do it right, we can save our planet long enough for us to develop artificial intelligence, transhumanism, the singularity, and we can have the Star Trek future. If we don't do it, we'll die in just like, you know, deprivation and heat and fucking poverty and hunger, and it won't be any fun. So we have hell and heaven in front of us. And the challenge is, can we achieve social and political and technological uh, union? And uh, I believe we will, right? I think we can. I believe in this. I think we have a future ahead of us and that humanity did not come this far just to die in a fucking sun-baked, you know, hit, you know, pit. So let's do it, folks. Let's get together. Let's make it happen. And let's, let's bring about a future better than we could ever have imagined. We can have children and our children can live on fucking Venus. It'll be amazing. So that being said, right, thank you, everybody, for this conversation. Thank you for everyone for participating. Please follow and subscribe to the Roundtable Discord podcast on YouTube and BitChute. And especially join the Roundtable Discord server where this takes place every day at 8 p.m. Central. We will be having podcasts every day, uh, and you can find over 200 episodes on the RT Podcast channel. Thank you so much. Let's uh, close this now and jump up to the uh, roundtable voice chat number one. We'll continue to chat for the remainder of the night. Thank you so much, and God bless. Thank you, Zoo. Thank you, NSA. I love y'all. Amazing content. Thank you so much.